Well, welcome to our final uh, session for the day. Uh, we're going to get straight into it. So if you've got a Bible, please uh, get it out or log on or whatever you need to do uh, to the book of 1 Peter. And we're going to read uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 11. Uh, and then Greg will come and bring us our final message for the day. So if you could turn to 1 Peter uh, chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with that same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. If you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so in the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. I've got bad news and good news. First, the bad. The doomsday clock is currently set at two and a half minutes to midnight, which is the closest the world has been to monumental catastrophe for the last 64 years. We can thank nuclear weapons, climate change and Donald Trump for that scary scenario. But the good news is it's not too late to protect yourself against the looming threats. And there are plenty of so-called doomsday preppers doing just that. They're building bunkers and bolt holes and filling them up with everything they need to withstand the disintegration of civilization. Which brings me to some more bad news. The cost of survival doesn't come cheap. All eyes are on Hurricane Sandy. Only a year after the deadly Deepwater Horizon explosion. Finger pointing. Met with an Ebola patient who recovered. The fake news. Financial security of all Americans. So there it is. Uh, the doomsday clock is apparently set at two and a half minutes to midnight. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Apparently it was created in 1947 by the Atomic Science and Security Board. And basically, it just represents how close we are to catastrophe. And they said it's, it's been out as far as 17 minutes to midnight, but apparently we're closer to catastrophe now than for the last six decades, thanks to nuclear weapons, climate change, and who would have thought Donald Trump's reach even is the, to the end of the world? But the thing is, people take this stuff really seriously. Have you seen those shows, uh, those TV shows, like Doomsday Preppers. It's all about how people set up these bunkers to prepare for the doomsday scenario. And weirdly, one of the things you notice is how many families do all of this together. It's a mum, dad, and the kids thing. Because you know what they say, the family that preps together fights the zombies together. It's a, it's a family thing. But so far as I can tell, most of these people are just plain bonkers. I mean, have a look at that picture for a moment. Is there anyone in that picture that you would trust with a weapon? <laughs> I think the scariest thing about the whole doomsday scenario is this is humanity's future breeding stock. That is our gene pool for the future. And yet, you know, the strangest thing is they're right. 
Doomsday actually is at hand and Christians ought to be doomsday preppers. Because have a look what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind. See, Peter agrees. Doomsday is near. It's closer to even, than even two and a half minutes. It's just that the end that Peter's talking about is not nuclear war. Have a look in verse 5. Now, they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The end that Peter's talking about is actually God's judgment. And Peter has talked about this already in the book of 1 Peter. He said that we call on a judge, a father who will judge justly. And he said that one day God is going to come and visit this world for judgment. See, we've called this weekend life on the road, and we're talking about traveling that road, but the thing we've got to remember is the road has an end. One day, God is going to call time on this world, and he's going to start a new one. And Peter says, that end is near. Doomsday is near. That's Peter's mindset. The thing is, I'm starting to realize that I don't think it's mine. I mean, I know this theoretically. It's just that I've got the, the same problem that the scoffers have in 2 Peter chapter 3. Just flip over one book towards the back of your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3 for a second. And look in verse 3. He says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They'll say, Where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestor died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. You know what I think? You've got a point. It's not a point I agree with, but it is a point I feel. Life just does feel like it goes on and on, doesn't it? Life on the road. Every day, sun rises, sun sets, seasons roll on. My kids all grow up. Where is this coming, he promised? And what it means is I just forget that the end is nigh. I just assume that we're all just going to keep traveling this road and one day my kids are going to grow up and they're going to have kids of their own and I'll have the grandkids and I'll retire and I've got all the time in the world. Which means that, to be honest, I don't feel very alert to it. I don't feel very convicted. I've I've settled into life on the road. Because the thing is, look at what Peter says next in 2 Peter 3 verse 5. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens, and the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter says, God's already destroyed the world once by fire, by water. And there is a reservation, he says. There is an appointed time when God's going to destroy it again. The road that we're walking down will end. And in 1 Peter 4, he says that end is so near. And so we've got to be alert. We've got to be sober-minded about this. We've got to be doomsday preppers. Now, what does that look like? How do Christians prepare for the end of the world? Do we build a bunker? Do we stockpile food and store up rations? Now, look, this passage is helpful. It gives us four things we've got to do. Here are four things we need to do to prepare for the end of the road. You can see my point two on your outline. And the first thing you have to do is you've got to arm yourself. Have a look in two, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body... Arm yourselves with the same attitude. In fact, the word that Peter uses there is about getting armed. It's about stockpiling your arsenal. And look, this is something that the doomsday preppers, they really get into. These guys love their guns. I'm wondering if some of them are actually praying for doomsday so that they can crack out the Uzi because the time's come. And you think, well, why would they need guns? What on earth are they going to shoot? And the answer is us. 
they figure when doomsday comes, we're all going to be unprepared and we're going to be banging on their door asking for food and shelter. They're arming themselves against us. But Peter says Christians arm ourselves differently. The big irony is we don't arm ourselves to hurt others. We arm ourselves to be hurt. Look in chapter 1 again, uh, verse 1 again. Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself with the same attitude. See, Christians don't arm ourselves with weapons. We arm ourselves with an attitude of suffering. And in fact, the word there for attitude, it's more like intention. Arm yourself with the intention to suffer, the will to suffer. Which actually sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? It's strange. Do Christians go about seeking out suffering? Do we intend to suffer? Because that's actually what the rest of the verse sounds like, doesn't it? Have a look. Arm yourselves with the same intention because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. So as Peter saying there, what we've got to do is seek out suffering because somehow suffering will get rid of, will purge us of our sin, like something, somehow suffering purifies the soul or something. Because some Christians have thought that's what Peter meant. Some Christians have deliberately punished their body with things like starvation and deprivation and pain because they thought that it would rid them of sin. Look, I don't think Peter means that at all. I think he's telling us to prepare for suffering and not run from it. To arm ourselves with a willingness. See, all the way through this letter, Peter has been saying, Christians will suffer because we follow the suffering Jesus. Just flip back to chapter 2, verse 20 for a minute. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Peter said, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it, This is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. See, Christians are going to suffer because we're following in the footsteps of the suffering Jesus. He's our example and he's calling us to follow along behind him. Persecution is coming if you are a Christian. Now, of course, we need to realize what our suffering is going to look like because it's actually going to look slightly different to Peter's day, isn't it? Peter talks there in verse, chapter 2, verse 20, about receiving a beating and enduring it. But that's not likely to be our experience, is it? Not just yet. You're not likely just yet to be beaten up for being a Christian. Now, in our day, what it looks like is being shamed. Public shaming is our world's way of beating people up now. So one of the best books I've read recently is this book on the screen. It's by Glenn Harrison. It's called A Better Story, and it's a brilliant book. It's about where our culture's heading, and it's about what it's going to be like to be a Christian over the next 50, 100 years. And what he says is, we live in a fame-shame culture. He says, we've all got this kind of social media profile. We live in an online world, and the worst thing you can do in this online world is shame someone, destroy their reputation. He says, in fame-shame culture, people yearn to feel included in the group, a state constantly endangered, fragile, and desperately in need of protection. In a social media world, we have to manage our reputations before a much broader, less connected Facebook public with powerful tools for evoking humiliation and shame. And when the mob turns against you, there isn't much to buffer its power to shame. That's what suffering looks like now, isn't it? It's not physical beating, it's shaming. On Facebook, on Twitter, on the work email thread, I poke up my head and I defend the Bible or say that I don't approve of sexual immorality or same-sex marriage and back just comes this hail of abuse. You're intolerant, you're bigoted, you're homophobic, you're a hater and comment after comment on Facebook and Twitter just piles on the shame until what we do is we just put our heads back below the parapet and we slink back into line. Peter actually talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, have a look in 4, verse 3. He says, you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. 
They're surprised that you don't join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. That is what the beating looks like in the 21st century, isn't it? Heaps of abuse. Israel Folau is a classic, isn't he? Let's talk about Israel Folau for a moment. What did you think? As far as I can see, everyone's saying a bunch of different things. Here is my take on the Israel Folau thing. Here is my question for you. Was he insensitive? Well, I think we probably all agree that what he posted on Facebook, what he posted on Twitter was actually insensitive. He talked about people going to hell in maybe a way that wasn't as kind, it wasn't in gen- as gentle as it, as it could have been. Was he smart? I think probably not. That is, the world is trying to paint Christians in a particular box. They're trying to paint us as intolerant, as haters, as bigots, and he walks straight into the trap that the world is trying to paint for us. My next question is, was it true? And he pretty much just quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Now, because of those first two things, was it gentle and, and was it smart, a lot of Christians have said, we don't want anything to do with him. Because of the third thing, was it true? I personally want to stand with him. There'll be plenty of Christians who will say dumb, ungentle things, and I'm one of them. <laughs> but when they, stand with, when they speak the truth, I personally want to stand with them. And so I, I have and I will. But that's what 21st century suffering looks like. And what Peter's saying is, arm yourself with a readiness for this. Arm yourself with a willingness, with the fortitude, with the grit to suffer. Don't be caught unprepared and don't shrink back. Toughen up, arm yourself. So let me ask you, Are you armed? In the 21st century, you cannot be universally liked and a follower of Jesus. Doesn't work that way. Not that it ever really did. But in our culture, it's only getting harder. I mean, you've noticed the difference between the the change in how Christians are being perceived, haven't you? We used to be seen as the nice people. I mean, slightly boring, kind of daggy. But we were morally nice. We married people in our nice churches and we fed the poor and we ran our op shops. And that's how Christians were seen when I became a Christian in the 80s. Now we're the homophobes. Now we're the pedophiles. Now we're the woman haters. Now we are a threat to society that has to be stamped out. And in the next 30 years, that's only going to become more pronounced. So are you armed? To be honest... I'm scared. I'm scared because I'm not actually very brave. And I'm arming myself by asking God to strengthen me. God, be, give me the strength I don't have. God, help me to be braver for Jesus. God, help me to be made of sterner stuff for Jesus. It's actually going to be good for us. Especially because as we learn this grit... In the face of persecution, Peter says we'll also be tougher in the face of sin. Because look look at verse 1 again. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for human desires, but rather for the will of God. See, as I stand up against people's abuse... I'm building the kind of resolve that it also takes to fight sin. I'm teaching myself to live for the will of God. And it's not that it's not the suffering has any kind of magical purifying effect on my soul. But suffering does have a toughening effect on my character. I choose to stand with God, whether it's in the face of persecutors or porn. I choose to stand with God. I choose to obey God, whether it's in the face of the mob or materialism. Whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. We learn as we learn to suffer, we learn the grit that it takes to to fight sin. I don't know about you, but I've actually seen Christians who are like this. 
One of my old pastors used to regularly get smashed by the media and often by other Christians because one, he was brave, two, he was conservative, he stood up for the Bible, and three, he was kind of slightly abrasive. And I noticed that he had the battle scars. You know, he, he had this toughness about him in his Christian life. He was dogged when it came to praying. He took his godliness really seriously. He had a Christian backbone. And that's what Peter's talking about here. He's saying the end is coming. So arm yourself. Get a backbone. Because with it is coming suffering. But that's not the only way that Christians prepare for the end of the world. Have another look in verse 7. This is the second one. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. Now, would you have put that at the top of your doomsday prepping list, prayer? Doomsday preppers are really into lists. This is one of the things I've noticed. There's all these lists on the internet about all the things that you need to do to prepare for doomsday and all the stuff that you need to collect. There's fishing supplies and animal traps and bazookas and bear traps and all that sort of stuff. One of my hobbies is actually watch collecting. I love collecting old watches. And I even found a blog on what watch you need to get to prepare for doomsday. Because, you know, in the middle of the zombie apocalypse, you're going to want to be punctual. So you're going to need a watch for this. (laughs) The thing is, Christians don't prepare by stockpiling stuff. We're not relying on what we can do. Christians prepare by coming to our Father. At the end of the world, we're not about building our own sufficiency. We're about trusting in the sufficiency of God. What do we pray for? Well, I think we pray for all sorts of things. But I think we pray for the end to come. I think we pray for the end of the world. So in 2 Peter 3, we read 2 Peter 3 earlier, and almost the very next thing that Peter says from the passage we just read was, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. See, Christians are actually people who are looking forward to doomsday. We're looking forward because in verse 13, it's going to mean a new heavens and a new earth, and this world with all its debauchery and lies and drunkenness and slander, this world is going to end, and the next world will be the home of righteousness. And so we're looking forward to it and speeding its coming. Isn't that a weird phrase? We speed its coming. How do we do that? I think one, by our godliness, but two, by our prayer. Almost the very last words of the New Testament are, Come, Lord Jesus. Christians pray for the end of the world. And you know, as I was rereading this passage, I was shocked. Because I can't remember the last time I prayed it. I can't remember the last time I said, Jesus, please come back. I can't remember the last time we prayed it as a church. I can't remember the last time I saw it at a conference. I think it's because I'm just not sober-minded. I'm just not alert. If I, if I was, I'd be praying for it. Guys, we need to commit ourselves for praying to Je- for Jesus' return. Pray it every day. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and end this mess. Come, put an end to the unrighteousness. Come and bring salvation and save people. Yes, because in 2 Peter 3, that's why he hasn't come yet. Keep saving people, but Jesus, come back. And in fact, this week, I did pray it every day. And you know what it did? It made me more sober-minded. It made me more alert to the ungodliness in the world and also in my own heart. And it made me, it made me think more clearly about possessions and about righteousness and about distractions. Praying God send Jesus back actually lifted my eyes. So commit yourself praying, Jesus, come back. I think it would do us the world of good. And even more than that, maybe Jesus will answer it. Maybe he will. So Christians arm ourselves, uh, Christians prepare for the end by one, arming ourselves to suffer, two, praying. But the next thing's another thing we wouldn't assume. It's with love. Have another look in verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray, above all, loving each other deeply. 
Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. What is key for preparing for doomsday, doomsday prepping? But he says, you've got to love each other deeply. And that word deeply, it's earnestly, it's desperately, eagerly. Christians prepare for the end of the world by loving each other. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that the only way Christians are going to survive the world out there is when there is real and sincere love in here. I mentioned one of the things about earlier about the, the doomsday preppers. They're, it's a family thing. Families all kind of work in it together. They've all got their different jobs and their own specialist roles. And when you think about it, knowing that the world out there is against you actually has a powerful unifying effect, doesn't it? When it's us against the whole world, suddenly us starts to actually mean something, doesn't it? And Christians need to realize this. Being part of a loving church really is the only way to survive the 21st century, I think. I mentioned the book by Glenn Harrison, in a better story. He says, it's hard to swim against the flow. We hate being the odd one out. Holding views that are different to the majority makes us feel uncomfortable, excluded, distrusted. It puts us under the uncomfortable spotlight of other people's scrutiny. But even one compatriot with a view similar to yours strengthens your hand. Kindred spirits are crucial to keeping minority ideas alive. Minority groups, if they want to survive, must start to act like a minority. They need to make active efforts to nourish their beliefs and patterns of life in ways that make them plausible to their members. They need intellectual leaders, attractive role models, the opportunity for members to rehearse and consolidate their ideas in the conversational fabric of their group, just like the majority outside. In other words, if we are to survive the world that we're moving into, we really need to be locked in to churches. When the world out there is against us, we need to be a family in here. We need to be in the place where we get told, you are not stupid. You're not strange and backward for believing in Jesus. You're not a homophobe. You're not a bigot. We need to be told those things. And we need to be part of a church where people are going to love us no matter what. No matter how badly we stuff up, even when we sin against each other. I think that's what Peter means in verse 8. Look in verse 8. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And at first, that actually sounds a bit dodgy, doesn't it? Because in our day, any covering up of sins is a bad thing. This is where the Roman Catholic Church got it so wrong. They covered up a multitude of sins. But that's not what Peter means. He's talking about forgiveness. He's talking about being the kind of church that loves each other deeply enough to forgive. That when I sin against you, you cover it over with forgiveness because you love me. The world out there hates us and the world out there is looking for anything they can charge us with, any kind of blame they can attach to us. But in here, even sin won't break us apart. See, I'm wondering if church is maybe more crucial than Christians are used to thinking. For decades, church has been a helpful thing for Christians. It's been helpful for me to go on a Sunday and get reminded. It's been helpful for me to have Christian friends. It's been helpful for me for raising my kids. Now church is crucial. Christians will not survive without the people who gather around us. You don't hold the line on things like homosexuality and abortion and euthanasia, and same-sex marriage, without Christians standing next to you and reminding you of the truth. We won't resist temptations like porn and adultery without our brothers standing beside us and calling us forward. We won't survive without knowing that there's a group of people around us who love us even when the world hates us. And look, guys, I think men need to be told this more than anyone else in the church. So the thing about men is, over time, we get more and more isolated as we get older. Most of us as teenagers, we had loads of mates. 
We went through school as, a, as part of a tribe and we played sport together and we played in the playground together. And, but once we grew up and we started working and then family comes and we got busier and busier and busier and slowly, one by one by one, our friendships just kind of drop off the radar until the only friend we've actually got left is our wife. And then we retire and make her life hell by just hanging around her. And All that means is, is that you move into your 40s and 50s, there's no one asking you questions. There's no one noticing that you're not praying anymore. No one noticing that you're not at church. There's no one that we're humbling ourselves with and confessing our sin with. I tell you, that isolated guy, he is easy pickings when it comes to something like adultery. That guy is easy to pick off when it comes to porn or career because he hasn't got this band of brothers around him loving him earnestly, eagerly, desperately. Guys, you have to lock into church. Get into that Bible study group of men or the prayer triplet of men. Not because it's a rule, but because you're smart enough to know that you need it. That's why you need to be in your family the one who says, we are going to church every week, every single week. Because you know, in most churches, most regulars only go two weeks in four. The other two weeks, they're actually missing. Now, whenever I say that to a group of people, people come up to me and go, no, 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 we are there every week. But when you take out four weeks of holidays, plus the weeks when one of the family members is sick and so none of us go, and then there's the work trip and then there's the family events and the weekends where we get laid back on Saturday night and so we're too tired to go to the next day, Churches that have 60% of their members turning up on a Sunday are actually doing better than average. You know what that means? It means that if you're not in a men's group, and if you're not reading the Bible by yourself, your annual diet of the Bible with 20-minute sermons is about 10 hours of Bible a year. Guys, you need to be at church every week. Build your weekend around church. Let church blow up the rest of your weekend. Whatever else we're doing, we're coming back for church. If we go away on Saturday, we're back for church on Sunday. When we're sick, the ones who aren't sick are going to go to church. On holidays, we're going to make sure we're at church. Tomorrow, take your family to church. You've been fed all all last night and today. Don't starve your family tomorrow. Take them to church. Not because it's a rule, but because this is what helps us to keep alert on the road. Church gets us praying. Church arms us. Whatever else happens, be at church. And the last thing is, make sure you serve there. Because that's the last way we prep for doomsday. Look in verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So Peter talks there about serving in the light of doomsday. When you first read it, you think, well, what's this got to do with the end of the world? Peter doesn't mention the end of the world there. He's just telling us to serve each other. But I think the key word is there in verse 10. It's the word stewards. See, the steward was the servant that you entrusted your property to when you went away. Jesus talks about stewards in Luke chapter 12. He says, Who then is the faithful and wise steward whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It'll be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, we'll put him in charge of all his possessions. You see, the, we're stewards and our master is away. But he's coming back. And in the meantime, he has entrusted something to us. Look in chapter 4, verse 10 again. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. See, Jesus has entrusted to all of us gifts of his grace. And Peter mentions things like speaking there and serving in verse 11. 
But when you think about it, there are all sorts of different gifts. You, you find a list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You find another list in Ephesians chapter 4. Peter mentions some other lists in chapter 5 of 1 Peter. That is, there are all sorts of different gifts. Some of them are teaching, some of them are organizing. In, in, a jo- in a church, there are all sorts of different jobs. We have people doing stacks of different jobs. We've got a whole team of people who just make coffee because if Christians have one addiction, it's to coffee. We've been given, all, all of us, every single one of us, have been given gifts to serve the church. But here's the thing. They're not our gifts. They belong to Jesus. We're his stewards. Everything we have belongs to Jesus. And he's entrusted everything we have to us until he returns. And one day when Jesus returns, he's going to hold us to account for how we have used his gifts. On doomsday... Your master is going to come to you and ask how you've used what he's entrusted to you. The time he's entrusted to you. The money he's entrusted to you. Your brains, your abilities, your kids, your marriage, your house. All those things belong to Jesus. And Peter says, use all of those things to serve Jesus. Use your gifts because they're not yours they're Jesus. So I think I've realized I talk about serving at church unhelpfully. I encourage people to serve at church for a bunch of reasons. I say, come and serve at church because you'll belong. You'll build relationships, you get part of a team, and it's great. Come and serve at church because it's fun to use your gifts. You actually get to be good at things. Come and serve at church because it's going to be helpful to others. And all those things are true. What I don't often say is, come and serve at church because your master has entrusted you with his gifts And one day he's going to ask you what you did with them. I don't often say that because I'm not often brave enough, but I'm going back to Newcastle tonight. (laughs) You are on this road to serve Jesus. So don't be a passenger. Don't let others carry you and carry the load. Don't force the women in your church to carry the load that we men should be carrying. Because that's the great shame of men in our churches, isn't it? Sounds like it's also the great shame of men on the mission field. It's women carrying the load. It's women who teach the kids. It's women who lead the music. It's women who organise things. It's women who are standing up and offering to preach because men won't do it. And we stand by and let them because we say, well, look, I work hard all week. I've got a stressful job. I haven't got time to do this. I've got enough stress in my life. Guys, doomsday is coming. We're on this road for such a short time. Our master is coming back and he has given you gifts. You have so much to contribute, so much to give to the church that Jesus wants you, no, commands you to give to the church So shoulder the load. Lead the men's group. Meet with a younger bloke one-to-one. Teach the youth group. Join the welcoming team. Join the setup team. Join the pack-down team. We've all got different gifts. And you might go, yeah, but I'm not good at any of those things. You got trained for your job? Get trained for this. Churches with men who lead are always stronger. Because all the great things that Guy said about marriage earlier are equally true of Jesus' bride, the church, aren't they? Churches where men lead don't stop women from leading. They actually increase the opportunities for women to lead because the women actually feel supported. This week, give your pastor a call and say to him, I want to shoulder some of the load. Can you meet with me? And tell me how I can be trained. And after he's picked the phone back up and got back up off the floor, (laughs) blow him away. See, we're on this road and it's only getting tougher. And at the end of that is doomsday itself, which is also for us the beginning of paradise. What kind of Christians survive? Christians that arm themselves with a willingness to suffer. Christians that pray for the end.
because they trust in not what they've stockpiled, but in the one who provides. Christians who love each other and Christians who serve the master before he comes back. Let's pray that we're going to be those kinds of men. Our great God, please send Jesus back. We come before you as your humble servants and as your children. And we ask you, please send Jesus back. Please begin the eternal reign of our beloved Lord. May the day come when we rest in heaven with you, when we rejoice in his glory, when you wipe every tear from our eye, when we rule the universe with Jesus and where we cheer him on as he rules. We pray that you would please send Jesus back. And in the meantime, we ask that you would help us to prepare well. Most of us aren't brave. We pray that you would arm us with a willingness to suffer. Help us not to shrink back, not to deny Jesus, but to be prepared. Make us people of prayer who long for you and call for you to send Jesus back. And we pray for our churches that when the world hates us, we pray that we won't fight. We pray that we won't be divided. Instead, we pray that we'll love and we pray especially that as men, we'll lock into those relationships with the other guys who hold us to the faith. We pray for deep and rich relationships where we do more than talk about the footy and more than talk about the weather, but we talk about our temptations. We pray together. We call each other during the week and we really do walk this road together. And we pray that we'll also shoulder the load together. We thank you that every single man in this room has been gifted. We thank you that you are that generous that no one has missed out. We pray that we will use the gifts, your gifts, for your glory. Until Jesus Christ returns. Amen.